Thank you. My name is John Black. I'm the pastor at Countryside Covenant. Been here seven years. Originally from New York. I was in youth ministry for about 19 years. Um, not about. Uh, in Indiana, in Illinois, and in Salina, Kansas. Now I'm a senior pastor, trying to figure out how to do that the last seven years and still learning. If you pray for my voice, yesterday I couldn't talk hardly at all, so I went to the doctor wondering what I had. He just gave me this powerful cough medicine with codeine. I had it this morning, so this may be one of my more inspired messages I've ever given. <laughs> or maybe if I start talking loopy, then bring the band back up real quick. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but to set that up, I want to share the end of chapter 2. Apostle Paul writes, uh, be, Give thanks to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us, he spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of, of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, we speak Christ. We speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. This morning I'll be talking about being a witness, something that I never enjoyed or appreciated. Because when I was raised as a kid, I was raised in a home, you might describe it as an eat your vegetables type of home. It was something I knew I had to do. I knew I had to live this way, but I really didn't enjoy it, you know? Eat your vegetables. Yuck, I hated vegetables. But that's kind of the home I was raised in. One who had a moral list of do's and don'ts. Even Sunday school teachers, okay, Johnny, you must share your toys with one another. Don't hit your brother. Don't swear at your brother. You know, treat your parents with honor and respect. Johnny, go visit your grandparents and pretend that you enjoy it. You know? Uh, Johnny, don't play Dungeons and Dragons or violent video games because you might go ballistic one day and for real. So I had this moral list of do's and don'ts, um, a duty-driven faith, if you will, a, a moral faith, moralistic faith. But I really didn't enjoy it. Eat your vegetables. Ew. Okay? I'll do it because I know it's good for me, but I don't like it. <clears throat> As I grew older, I was encouraged by my youth directors and parents to own my own faith, have my personal quiet time, uh, to share my faith with others. But I didn't want to do that. That was the problem. I had no desire, no passion to share my faith. In fact, I didn't even dare say, God bless you to someone who sneezed. Because as a Christian, I was pegged as a Christian kid. I had a reputation to uphold. I wasn't, I wasn't accepted by the popular group in high school. I wasn't invited to the parties because I, I was a Christian. In fact, there were parties going on right next door. And just about my entire class, it seemed, they were at this party, but I was up in my bedroom reading Campus Life magazine. Do they still make Campus Life? Like Brio magazine? And so I was reading this magazine thinking, if this is what I need to share, then I don't wish this on anyone because I'm lonely, I'm insecure, I don't really enjoy living my faith, eat your vegetables. So that was my upbringing. As believers, though, we are called to share our faith. We have this common call to be witnesses for him. You know, it, Acts 1.8 says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witness in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We are called to make God's invisible kingdom visible by the way we speak, by the way we act, by our thoughts. And then, of course, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says, Go into all the nations and make disciples. <coughs> But I've noticed that throughout the years, many, even in churches where I've served, rather than living the Great Commission, we more live the Great Omission. Or the Great Suggestion at best. Like, oh, I'll do it if I feel led to do so. But it wasn't an option. It was a call for each one of us. 
Long-time members, leaders of even my church confess to me that they have a really difficult time going up to people who are visitors on a given Sunday. These nervous visitors come into church wondering if this might be the church for them. And the people who've been there all their lives, they have a difficult time going up to them, much less being a witness to those out there. You know, those people who don't know Christ, those people in the darkness. And yet that's our common call. Have you ever witnessed to someone? Have you ever gone up to a stranger and shared Christ with them? I would suggest that oftentimes we lack boldness, passion, or desire to share the gospel or the good news of Christ because we live according to the old covenant, which is a list of do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments, the moral code, if you will. And we don't have a passion or desire for the same reason I didn't in high school and middle school. I lived according to the old covenant. It wasn't a faith that brought joy to my life. I would also suggest that we live under guilt and defeat because we read scriptures like the one that I read that we are to be God's aroma, the aroma of Christ. We're to preach the gospel. We're to spread, spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ and speak with sincerity. But we feel like we don't do that, so we feel guilty. We don't measure up. We fall far short of how God wants us to live, what he wants us to be as his witnesses. And I would suggest we live according to the old covenant. So how can we develop a passion and a desire to do so, to be a witness for Christ? Paul's answer is, we can't. In and of ourselves, we can't conjure up that desire within to be witnesses. We will fall short. But the secret of the gospel is that God can do it through us by his indwelling Holy Spirit. He can give us the desire and the passion and the strength to do so and the wisdom to do so. But we have to live according to the new covenant, not the old covenant. And look at verse 4 of chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Paul found his competence and his confidence in Christ and Christ alone. The people of Israel, they lived according to the law, the old covenant. In verse 3 it says, they lived according to the tablets of stone, if you will. The law was given to Moses, and it was a glorious thing. It gave the nation of Israel a code to live by. It gave them boundaries. It gave them an identity. But at the same time, they couldn't keep the Ten Commandments in the law. They kept falling short. They kept failing. They didn't have the passion and desire within to live according to it ultimately, to live consistently by that. And we don't either when we try to live by this moral list of obligations and rules. <clears throat> the Old Covenant says, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. You know the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt honor your parents. Thou shalt not murder. Uh, do's and don'ts, if you will. But the New Covenant, as prophesied by Ezekiel, says something altogether different. Ezekiel prophesied that you're going to receive something new, something that will be empowering. And Ezekiel writes, I will sprinkle clean water on you, God is saying, and you will be clean. <clears throat> I will cleanse you from all your impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. Notice that you shall and you shall not is different in the new covenant. It's God saying, I will do this. I will do this for you. I like what, what Dwight Edwards says. He says, the old covenant is man demonstrating what he can do for God, and the new covenant is God demonstrating what he can and will do through man or woman. All together different. God never requires anything of us that he hasn't first given us from within. Put it this way. If you wanted to learn how to play hoops better, and if you had enough money, you could rent LeBron James for two weeks and have lessons 
from LeBron James in your gym here, and he will teach you how to be a better basketball player. By the end of two weeks, you'll be a lot better, I would, I would guess. But still after two weeks, even after two years of being with LeBron James, you still won't be able to play like LeBron James. The only way that we can play like LeBron James is if LeBron James were to morph himself and come and live inside of our bodies and play hoops through us. Then we could jump like James. Then we could shoot like LeBron James and dribble like him because he's playing through us. And that's essentially what God has done for us. He says, I'm going to live my life through you. Your life is not you trying to live for me any longer. It's my life living through you as you surrender to me and allow me to do so. That's new covenant living. And that's how we can be witnesses for Christ. And then next, Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 contrasts the old covenant with the new covenant. And he says that the old covenant of the law kills and the new covenant gives life. He says in verse 6, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not the letter of not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. If the ministry that brought death, which is engraved in letters on stone, the Ten Commandments, came with glory, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? How does the law kill? How do the Ten Commandments kill? They don't. They're glorious. But it's when we try to live by them and we feel like we can become righteous and acceptable before God by living according to the Ten Commandments in the law, then that will kill because we will inevitably fall short and the wages of our sin brings death. When we live by the law, we will die by the law. But the spirit of the new covenant brings life. It brings transformation from the inside out and it enables us to live the way we're uh, supposed to. When I was walking home one day as a senior in high school in, in New York State, um, I, was, I remember praying. It was a spring day, and I was walking home, and, Lord, I'm sick and tired of trying to live for you. I can't do it. I fall short. I don't even have the desire. I'm living in conflict. I want to go to the parties. I want to live this way, but you're calling me to live this way, and I don't even want to do so. God, I just give up. You've got to do something in me. And it was right then and there, boom, my eyes were opened. Something happened on the inside walking home that day that I can't even begin to explain. But I had the desire from that day forward to be a witness for Christ. I had a desire to live for him. In fact, that summer, I, with a few friends, got together and we started a jail ministry. And we went to the local jail, which led us to go to the uh, prisons like Attica State Penitentiary in Elmira that summer. And we'd go into these prisons and we'd share our testimonies. Something happened on the inside when I gave up and when the Lord began to live his life through me. He changed my desires and my passions. You know, we're going into these prisons saying, yeah, when I was in middle school, I stole some money from my mom's purse, but now I'm a changed, changed man, you know, telling these hardcore prisoners. But at the same time, I had this desire to live for him. A change took place in my life. The have-tos became want-tos. The eat-your-vegetables type of faith became a here's-your-steak kind of faith. Here's your pizza, something that I really like and I want to share it with you, and you'll like it too. Altogether difference. The old covenant kills, the new covenant brings life. Secondly, Paul goes on to say, the old covenant condemns, and the new covenant brings righteousness. In verse 9, if the ministry that condemns is glorious... How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? When you get up in the morning and if you have a handheld mirror, you look into it and you think, e yuck, you know, your hair is messy and you don't have maybe girls your makeup on or, or whatever, you know, and you think, and the mirror can't do anything in and of itself to improve your looks. You can't take the mirror and comb your hair with it or brush your teeth with it or pop your zit with it. It only reflects our need for improvement. And that's what the Law and Ten Commandments did for us. It reveals our need for improvement, but it is powerless to change us. 
The law can only condemn you and tell you of your need to improve. But the new covenant brings righteousness. It makes us righteous on the inside. I've often used the old covenant or the Ten Commandments in my witnessing to others. I remember these guys come into my porch and they come from another religion, uh, a cult, you might say. And they used to come to my porch, actually a pair of them, every six months or so, a, a different pair. And they'd come in and sit, sit on my porch and I'd talk to them. And I would find out where they were from on their missionary journey and, and whatnot. And after I got done talking to them for about a half an hour, getting to know who they were, before they were able to offer the, me their spiel to, to convert me to their religion, I would ask them, before you go on, can I ask you a question? How do you know that you'll one day be in God's presence for eternity in heaven? How can you be sure of that? And their response was, well, we try to live by God's law and his commandments. And I said, oh, like the Ten Commandments? And they said, exactly. I said, that's good. Uh, can I ask you a few more questions? Yeah, go, go right ahead. Have you always honored your parents? Always. Perfectly. They said, well, no. Uh, me neither. Check. Have you ever had any idol or any false god before God? I mean, not an idol, but like money or time or car or friend. Have you ever put anything above God? Uh, yeah. So have I many times. Check. Have you ever lied to someone? Well, yeah, we have. So have I. Check. And I went down all Ten Commandments with them. I said, look at you've broken all Ten Commandments, and probably multiple times, and so have I. So when you stand before God one day, what's he going to say to us? And then guess what they said to me? They said this. They had no answer. I said, because we're guilty. We are so guilty. If we try to live by God's law and his commandments, when we stand before God, we will be guilty. It will, they will condemn us. And then I said, before you go on, can I tell you how I can have certainty that I will stand before God one day and be fully accepted into his kingdom? And they said, go for it. And then I explained to them a concept that they did not, did not understand. It's the truth of grace. Grace meaning God's righteousness at Christ's expense, the acronym. Or God's uh, riches or God's requirements at God's expense. I can be fully accepted not based on my own goodness, but based on the goodness of Jesus Christ who lives within me. I'm accepted because Christ is accepted by his Father and he lives in me. And they stared at me and they said, well, and after I said that, they said, thank you very much, and they left every time. Because they had, they had no comeback for that. They didn't understand it. And then thirdly, Paul goes on to say, the old covenant fades away and the new covenant lasts. In fact, it not only lasts, it increases in us. When Christ comes to live within us, in verse 10, he says this, For what was glorious has no glory in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that will last? It doesn't mean that the law and Ten Commandments are bad things. God said they're glorious things. But they're incapable of leading to salvation and righteousness and acceptability before God. We fall short. But here's the new covenant in verse 18 of chapter 3. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's, Lord's glory, are being transformed from the inside into the likeness, His likeness, with an ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That word change is metamorphosis, transformation. We are changed immediately, like when I was walking home from school on that spring day. I was changed, boom, like this. My desires changed. My disposition changed. Everything about me on the inside changed. My righteousness changed when I surrendered my life to Christ and his lordship. And then finally, God, uh, Paul, Paul writes... The old covenant produces insecurity and fear. And the new covenant offers us boldness and freedom. In verse 12, Since we have such hope, we are very bold, Paul writes. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Why did he do that? Moses, he, he shared the Ten Commandments with the people, but his radiance 
was glorious, but then it began to fade. And once it faded, the people said, oh, Mo, no glow. You know, he's fading. And when Moses realized he was fading, he put a, something over his head. Not because, not because of the glory, but because he didn't want people to see him for who he really was. Because of his insecurity. He wanted people to think of Moses as this great leader who, who radiate, radi, uh, radiates, who, who is radiant. And when he faded, he was just like everyone else. Don't we do that too? When we feel insecure, when we feel like we don't measure up, what do we do? We put on masks. We pretend, we pretend to be people we're not. And we can't be ourselves, we're insecure. But in the new covenant, when we allow Christ to live in and through us, we become very bold. Verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that's what I experienced that senior year in high school. I experienced a newfound freedom, an eat your vegetables type of faith, turned to a, man, here's your steak, man, this is awesome. If you see a great movie, the first thing you want to do is share it with your friends. This is good news. Good news of Christ. You want to share it with people because it's his spirit just welling up within us and flowing through us. We can't help but share his faith. If we don't, if we try and suppress it, then, you know, we'll, we'll be discontent. Just want to share one final story. It was that very same year, senior year in high school. I just graduated. I'd never, ever, ever witnessed to anyone verbally. I never even said, God bless you, as I said, to someone who sneezed. I sat in this park on this well with a fountain flowing in the middle. And I said, okay, God, here I am. I want to be a witness. I want to share you with someone. Lead someone to sit next to me right now, Lord. I prayed. And I saw some old people go by, some homeless people go by. Lord, have them sit by me. I'll, I'll share you with them. But wouldn't you know, these three really good-looking girls walked by, and they sat right down next to me. And I thought, oh, God, I got a reputation. Not them. I didn't, I didn't think they were very religious because they all lit up cigarettes, and they were smoking on their break from work, apparently. I didn't recognize them. They were from out of town, working at the hotel across the street, I found out. But my heart was going like this, and my stomach was churning, and I knew the Holy Spirit was in me saying, share Christ with these girls. So I initiated the conversation, and I must have looked really nervous. But as we got talking, my nerves dissipated, and after about 20 minutes conversation just with these girls, they said, well, we should get back to work Nice talking to you. And they stood up and they left. And my heart sank because I was a chicken. I wasn't bold enough to bring up Christ to them. I thought, oh, I blew it again, God. Or maybe you blew it, God. Maybe you didn't do it for me. My faith sunk. They were about 10 feet away. One girl stopped. And she said, wait. She looked at me and she said, by the way, are you religious or something? And I said, uh, no, I, I'm not religious, but I'm a Christian, and I try to live for the Lord. And she said, you do? And the other two girls turned around, and all three of them came and walked back toward me. And they sat back down on the seats there, and they turned toward me like this, crossed their legs, and then they just started asking me spiritual question after question. And I got to tell you, that was the first time in my life that I ever experienced boldness. The boldness of the Holy Spirit welling up within me. Man, I, I felt like Billy Graham Jr. I could have stood up on the well and preached to the entire park. I'm telling you, I've never ever, I, I had never felt that way before. It was his strength and my weakness coming through. And the Lord gave me wisdom, just lightning speed wisdom to be able to share with these girls, to respond to their questions. It was amazing. After they left, and when they were out of sight, I went, did a round off back, handspring back flip. I used to be a gymnast. I was like, God, that was amazing. That was amazing. You have changed me. That's the new covenant living that he gives us. When we live according to him, his life living through us, that's the secret. It's, God, I can't do anything. I was sitting there this morning during the worship. God, I, can't, I don't have the voice to speak even for 20 minutes. Lord, I can't do this. 
I fear that in and of myself, I'll make a fool of myself. I said, God, you need to be my strength and my weakness. I can't do this. It's your life. It's your spirit. Paul says, Christ is my life. That's the difference. It's not us trying to live according to a list of do's and don'ts, rules, morality. God, try to please him that way. Rather, knowing we already please him, we're already acceptable, therefore, we're going to allow you to live your life through me. And that, my friends, is how we are witnesses for Christ, in our actions and even in our words. Let's pray. Please stand for the benediction, too, if you will. <clears throat> God, I do thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Lord, that you are our weakness or you are our strength in our weaknesses. You are our boldness in our insecurities. You are our uh, righteousness when we fall short. I thank you, Lord, that it's your life living in us and through us that is pleasing and acceptable to you. And thank you, Lord, for your indwelling spirit who resides within all who know you and love you. I pray, God, that you empower my brothers and sisters in Christ not only to live uh, for you, not only to be witnesses in their lifestyle, but give them the boldness to even share the good news with others verbally as you lead them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.